Welcome. Thank you all for coming to Lincoln City Library's Native American Read-In this evening. My name is Carrie Simpson, and this evening we'll just keep things real casual and just have you come up one after the other. So when one of you is done reading, someone who's ready to read can stand up and come up to the podium. Please do remember to introduce yourselves so we all know who you are. And we're going to start with a few words from our Lincoln City Library's director, Pat Leach. Hello, everyone. I am Pat Leach, the director of Lincoln City Libraries. And there are five words that will be important tonight, and they are welcome, thanks, stories, read, and share, those five. So on behalf of the libraries, welcome to our Native American read-in. Thanks for being part of this event, and thanks to you also if you're viewing this event on Five City TV. We're at Gear Branch Library right now, but know that some of you may be viewing this later. What's important about this event is that we learn and tell the stories of people, because it's stories that often truly bring us together, and stories teach us. As a librarian, it probably won't surprise you to know that I hope that you will follow up by reading. At the library, we can help you with lots of things to read just through that door. Finally, all of this is so that we will share these stories together, because stories are better once they get shared. What we read is so much bigger when we talk about it. We're all so much smarter together, and our whole community is better when we share in this way. So welcome, thanks, stories, read, and share. And I'm going to begin with a couple of poems by a Native American author whose name is Joseph Bruchock. And I chose him because for several years, I sat next to a couple of young women at UNL volleyball games, and we had hardly anything ever to talk about. But every time we got together, I would say hi, and then I'd say, are you reading anything good? And I'm going to say for two years, the answer I got back was no. Until one night when I said, are you reading anything good? And she said, I read the best book this week. And it was Joseph Bruchock's Skeleton Man. And that got her going on quite a few different books. and. Uh, he is somebody who is from the Abenaki people in the northeast part of the United States. And I'm reading a couple of, of poems from The Earth Under Sky Bear's Feet, Native American Poems of the Land, by him, with pictures by Thomas Locker. These are all stories about perhaps what the earth seems like from the sky, from a variety of traditions. So the first one I want to read is The Northern Lights. Chief Morning Star had only one son. That boy would not play with the other children. Instead, each day he walked to the north and never told anyone where he went. Night fell and the boy did not return, so the old chief followed his son's tracks. He walked and walked and came to a strange land. The people there wore rainbows as belts. They had lights on their heads and played with a ball made of light. You are in the land of the northern lights, they said. Which one of these, those boys playing ball is your son? If you do not know, he can never come back. Chief Morningstar chose. My son, he said, is that one, the boy wearing the brightest light. Two great birds flew down to carry them home. Then, all around the father and son, the Waba Banal, the northern lights, played their game in the sky. And then this poem, this poem he wrote is a reflection of Navajo tradition in the southwestern part of the United States. It's called Don House Song. Below the mesas, a new house has been made. Now as the dawn starts to brighten the sky, painting the walls of the house with light, Sky Bear hears the people sing. Far to the east, there a house was made. A house was made, a beautiful house. The dawn, where, there his house was made. White corn, there his house was made. Soft possessions for them, a house was made. Water in plenty, for it a house was made. Corn pollen, for it a house was made. Before me, may it be beautiful. Behind me, may it be beautiful. Around me, may it be beautiful. Below me, may it be beautiful. Above me, may it be beautiful. All around me, may it be beautiful. Within me, may it be beautiful. And those are two poems by Joseph Bruchock. Thank you. Oh. 
Hello, all. Um, my name is Georgiana Lee. <clears throat> Georgiana Lee, Yinisha, Tohananishle, Totsotni Bashes Chinki, Ani Dashanella, Tachini Dashache. I'm from the Navajo Nation and I reside here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, I wrote this blog. Um, someone had asked me to share my experience. Um, um, there was a film called Video Letters from Prison, and it's about these three young Native girls whose father is in prison, and they don't have a good relationship, uh, really don't have a relationship at all. And um, the over, if you watch the film, they end up uh, building a relationship through video letters. And so I could relate to that from my own experience, and I wrote this in reflection of that film. <clears throat> a Blessing of Extraordinary Proportions by Georgiana Lee. The early bird gets the worm, my dad would always say. He's notorious for waking up between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. In those early dark hours, you can hear his steps, the smell of coffee brewing and the sound of pa newspaper pages turning. I'm not going to lie, I was incredibly annoyed by this, much like the rest of my siblings. Admittedly, I took a lot of my parents' teachings for granted at an early age. Today, I have a deep appreciation for my dad and the lessons he offers. I was born in Shiprock, New Mexico on the Navajo Nation in April of 1984, along with my twin sister. We were welcomed in this world by my mom, dad, four brothers, and two sisters. Understandably, mom and dad called it quits after having twins, bringing it to a total of eight children. Growing up loud and obnoxious, I didn't have the best relationship with my dad. He was more calm, patient, and diplomatic in his approach. He had to be. He was one of very few Native American business owners in the Four Corners region, where the boundaries of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado meet. My dad owned an auto body shop for 13 years before closing the doors. Closing the business didn't stop my dad um, in pursuing his leadership role within the Native community. He got deeply involved in helping Native seniors, veterans, and youth by fundraising for his projects. To this day, many of the programs he spearheaded continue to operate. My dad wasn't very open in communicating his affection toward me. I never heard him express his love verbally, though he made an effort to show his love in other ways. When I was in my late teens, my dad gifted me a Navajo rug dress. I was the only daughter to receive this. I also graduated from plain old moccasins to buckskin moccasins. My dad was teaching me another lesson, a lesson that I was now a woman. Fast forward about six years, I was in college and I received a call from one of my siblings. My dad was caught in the middle of trouble with the law and I'm not going to share any details out of respect for my dad and family. What I will say is that I admired the way he handled the difficult situation and humbly accepted the consequences of his actions when he really could have justified them. While my dad was getting settled in prison, the family was trying to adjust to this change. We didn't know what to do. Selfishly, my biggest fear was what other people, families, and friends were going to think of us. With the initial exchange of letters between my home in Lincoln, Nebraska and the Fort Worth Federal Penitentiary, I couldn't help but feel embarrassed at times. What if someone sees this letter? Will they know that my dad is incarcerated? What will they think of me? Did the mailman notice the address? I hope he doesn't think I'm exchanging love letters with a prison inmate. <laughs> After the average exchange of two letters per month, I got used to letters coming from my dad. At first, I didn't know what to say. The last time I had written notes was back in high school with my silly girlfriends. After several months, I began to look forward to reading his letters and responding. Our letters allowed us to, communi to communicate on a more honest and deeper level than we had in the past. Five days before I turned 25, I received a letter dated April 20th, 2009 from my dad. This is when I received the most memorable and most precious letters of all from my dad. Oh. My dear child, it's almost time again when you'll be celebrating your birthday. Sorry I won't be there to enjoy the festivities, but my heart is always with you always. Besides, it's only been a few years since you two came to challenge us to undertake an extraordinary hardship, yet a blessing of extraordinary proportions. 
I'm wishing you a happy birthday and all the good that comes with the fulfillment of life's purpose. The stupid nurse put you both in my arms when you were first breathing air on your own. I was pacing back and forth in the hallway when they came out with two sets of small blankets in a roll. I was not sure what they were doing, but they said, congratulations, Mr. Lee. Here are your twin girls. I was taken so much by surprise. I could not speak, but before I could say anything, one placed the roll of blanket in my left arm and the other roll in my right arm. It could not move. I could not tell if I had enough grip on the blankets. I felt like I had no control of the little babies. I was afraid I might grip too tight and squish the poor little creatures. I could see the little bitty heads. Anyway, they finally took the babies from me as they were laughing. That is how our journey began, yours and mine. You were, you were such a wonderful gift and still one. I want you to know that. You know how much your mom loves you, but you probably don't know how much I love you too. This is just to let you know that you always have your parents pulling for you, no matter where you are and no matter where we are. This was the first time I'd ever felt a strong expression of love from my dad. These were words I never heard before. Words that so many others have never heard in a lifetime and words I will never forget. After wiping my eyes and blowing my nose, <laughs> I thank the creator for this truly wonderful blessing and for, my, and for bringing my dad and I closer to one another. For months, we continue to write one another. Even after he was eventually, eventually released from prison, we continued to write. We later graduated to phone calls and texts. I still can't believe my dad texts. I don't understand what he's saying most of the time, but I get the idea. <clears throat> I've always believed that nothing happens by mistake. I don't believe in coincidences. The years have been very difficult for my dad, but, but through his incarceration, we've been able to build a strong relationship that includes understanding, encouragement, and laughter. I'm truly grateful for the relationship we have today. It took willingness, honesty, and courage on both our parts to get over our fears and slowly break down the uncomfortable wall between the two of us. Today, we're able to sit across from one another when I'm able to make it to New Mexico once a year. Our conversations are not general. When we communicate, we do so on a deep and meaningful level. Time is precious and words are powerful. Neither should be wasted. Wow, I sound like a fortune cookie. I try to make the best of what I got because one day it won't be there. Obviously, I came into the situation with prejudgments. I assumed all prison inmates were very bad people that did very bad things. When my dad was sentenced and settling into his cell, I was busy thinking about what other people thought. I have to remind myself often that what other people think of me is none of my business. Everyone has a right to feel, and so do I. I no longer feel shame. Sometimes there are good people out there that make bad choices. My dad would be proud to know that this bird woke up at 4.30 this morning to write this. He was right after all. It only took about 25 years for this bird to realize I get a lot of work done and am most productive in the early morning hours. If there were anything I would want you to get out of listening to these words, it would be that you realize that you too are a blessing of extraordinary proportions. Thank you, and good evening. I'm Brenda Ely, I'm the branch manager here at GEAR. I'm gonna read a poem tonight called um, Cherokee Dawn, and the author is unknown. I awaken to the silence. Softly, it wraps around the world. Dreams still float upon the air, not yet ready to loosen their memory. Quietly, I step outside the sleeping world unaware that I am there. Above me, the sky is still dark, stars still glimmer, but the moon is low. All about me, the air is hushed, 
Breezes gently ruffle my hair, caress my cheek. First morning song of the lark gently wafts across the valley. Seem, seems for me she sings alone. In the east there now is a faint, faint luminescence, a hint of pearly tones etch the edges of the tree-crowned hills. Strong and tall they await the coming of a new day filled with promise. More light gently flows westward. Now across the valley I see a vision. The hills are wreathed in a living mist. It moves, touches each thing in its path. The sky now is filled with glorious colors, blue, cerise, lavender, the hues of dawn. Mists slowly ebb backward into the forests, retreating, going home to await the night once again. My prayers are now said. Sage smoke still spirals to the heavens. I touch the ground gently in a gesture of gratitude as Grandfather Sun now has risen over the hilltops. The wispy mists now are gone. No longer can they be seen anywhere. Birdsong echoes from hillside to hillside, the morning well greeted. Day has come to Cherokee. Peacefulness surrounds the Great Smokies. Was it mist I truly saw? Or was it old ones keeping watch through the night? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Leo Yankton. And uh, we are here. Um, to celebrate uh, literature being uh, art and creating art through literature. Um, I don't personally have any literature that I am going to um, be reading to you today, but um, I want to talk about communication. And um, I want to talk about communication uh, through the pipe. A lot of people consider the pipe the peace pipe. That's, um, that's a common uh, American way of identifying it, but it's actually um, just a sacred symbol and um, Chinumpa in Lakota basically just means pipe. But um, what a lot of people don't know about the pipe is that it is a conduit of energy. Okay? Now, um, me personally, when I pray or meditate, um, I am generating a kinetic energy that I want to disperse out into the universe, out into the ether. Because I know that my spirit is an energy. When my body dies, my energy's signature doesn't die with it. It just goes to a different plane. And that's what we call the spirit world. Okay, um, so when I pray or when I meditate, which is sending out my kinetic energy into the universe, what I do is I either use my pipe that was handed down to me um, or if I don't have my pipe with me, a lot of times I'll put my hand in water because water is another conduit of energy. And so I generate this kinetic energy that I'm going to disperse out into the universe because I want the spirits of people like my grandmother, Jenny Yankton, to, um, to basically feel my my kinetic energy that I'm trying to burst out, basically. Okay, the pipe, and this is my understanding and my interpretation, okay, but the pipe works in the same way. All right, when I pray, I, I keep that kinetic energy that I've created in my mind, and whenever I get ready to smoke the pipe, all I'm doing is pulling in enough smoke to push back out that thought, that kinetic energy. And the smoke is the conduit that carries it to the spirit world, which is basically to the ether, which is basically part of our universe. You know, everything's connected through energy. Um, same way with water. You know, I'm just dispersing my kinetic energy. And the best way for humans to manifest that is through um, prayer and meditation. And if you're not really disciplined in meditation, 
then prayer is a, a is a really a good way through faith to really burst out that energy. Um, I'm going to sing a song. Okay, the song I'm going to sing is about communicating through the pipe, and um, it's a soft song. Um, we probably are going to want to close the door because it's you know we're going to disturb people who are reading. <laughs> but um, I'm kind of nervous. So I hope I remember all the words. Since it's in Lakota, you guys wouldn't know any anyways. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm being recorded, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but basically, another thing about these songs, if you ever did read the words to these songs, they're really, they're really kind of basic. But it's not the words that is really what you're um, creating here. You're creating uh, energy. You know, when we sing these songs and your spirit starts feeling this, it's that energy that you're creating inside yourself and you're dispersing it. And that's a communication that we use with what we call the spirit world, which is basically the universe, which is basically the ether and everything around us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to sing this song because it's a softer song and we're in the library. So <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> it goes like this. Now, when I sing this song, um, I can feel my, my body tingle. I can feel like an energy inside myself um, manifest itself like larger, like a pulse inside myself come out. And when we, when we sing with the drum, it's, it's, it's still pulsating. It pulsates more. I can feel it in my chest when I do it. And I'm not disciplined. I have some friends who are disciplined in meditation, but I am not. But when I do this, I know that I'm manifesting a lot of energy that I'm, that I'm pushing out. And this is part of communication for me, you know, because I do believe that I can manifest a lot of things through believing that the universe is connected and that these energies work together and can influence each other. Um, this is my interpretation of, of a type of communication. Uh, we're on literature, but this is something else that's also communication. and. Um, you know, it's an art form of communication as well. So um, I really appreciate being here and I appreciate everyone's time. Um, thank you for listening to my song and to my uh, words about communication. <laughs> All right, bye. -bye. Well, again, my name is Carrie Simpson, and I work at the Anderson Branch Library. And um, I found this short story called Who Was Sequoia? And imagine a man who cannot read or write. Now imagine the same man creating a brand new alphabet from scratch. It sounds next to impossible, doesn't it? Yet that is exactly what one man did, a man named Sequoia. He was born around 1770 in Tennessee. Sequoia was a Cherokee. Like other Native Americans of that time, he could neither read nor write. He couldn't help noticing, though, how white people, were, how white people wrote to one another on sheets of paper. They often used these talking leaves, as some Native Americans called them, to communicate. Back then, the Cherokee had no way to write down words in their own language. Sequoia believed it was important for the Cherokee to have a system of writing, so in 1809, he set out to create an alphabet that the Cherokee could use to do just that. Sequoia started by drawing pictures with each one representing a different word or idea. He soon realized that writing sentences using pictures would be much too difficult. There were too many words. No one would ever be able to remember that many pictures. So Sequoia decided to try a different approach. 
he began to develop symbols to stand for the sounds or syllables that made up words. Twelve years later, he completed a system of writing with 86 different symbols. Each one stood for a different symbol in the Cherokee language. The symbols could easily be put together to form words. Soon thousands of Cherokee were able to read and write in their own language. Sequoia's work did not end there, however. He helped establish a print shop and began publishing a bilingual newspaper in both Cherokee and English. The shop also printed books translated from English into Cherokee, and in later years, Sequoia became a political leader among the Cherokee. He died in 1843, but many Cherokee of today still use the alphabet he invented. Thanks to him, the Cherokee now have a written history that will never be forgotten. In his honor, in honor of his achievements, Sequoia's name was given to the giant redwood trees of California and the Sequoia National Park. The name Sequoia will never be forgotten either.